Welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. We are delighted today to have another of our events working with our friends at the IMF, uh, releasing this spectacular and frankly monumental work, post-crisis fiscal policy. Um, since I, I've been summoned to be one of the commentators, uh, I am excited to have us led and chaired today by a far more distinguished individual, Jose de Gregorio, who is now a non-resident senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute, former governor of the Central Bank of Chile, professor at Universidad de Chile, and of course someone who's been very active in the macro policy and fiscal debates in Latin America and worldwide for many years. So let me turn it over to Jose to host today's event. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much, Adam. It's a, it's a pleasure to chair this, uh, this session. Uh, one gets tempted when there's such a, a deep and, and long and interesting book to start commenting, but that's not my role. But now we'll discuss post-crisis fiscal policy. Of course, from emerging markets, from the point of view of the IMF, there were so many changes in the, in the policy prescriptions, and there are so many challenges in the in the in the fiscal policy debate that this is of course is a is a great contribution by staff people 21 chapters so we will start this uh, presentation with a with a with a presentation of the book by Abdelak Senjadi who has been the assistant director of the IMF fiscal affairs department since 2011 he joined the IMF in 1997 and has worked in many many departments he was also a professor of economics at the Business School of Washington University in St. Louis. He has a, a master's degree in Brussels and a PhD from U of Pennsylvania. And the other presenter, one of the three co-editors of this book is Philip Gerson, who is now the deputy director of the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department. He previously has a very distinguished and long career at the fund. He started in, in 1993 as a young professional in the EP program, as many of us start our life after graduating. Uh, he holds a PhD from John Hopkins, where he went to the IMF and has a very this, uh, distinguished career that now has uh, one of the uh, leaders at the Fiscal Affairs Department. So without further ado, I will leave them to, to present the book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jose, for uh, the introduction. And uh, thank you uh, to uh, Adam uh, for hosting this event. Um, Post-Crisis Fiscal Policy is uh, the first uh, IMF book uh, entirely devoted to uh, fiscal policy and the global crisis. It uh, underscores the, um, the evolution of our thinking about fiscal policy and has refocused our attention on fiscal sustainability issues. I should perhaps at the outset uh, give the usual disclaimer, which is the views expressed in the book are the authors alone. Uh, however, the book did uh, benefit uh, quite substantively from uh, the IMF's uh, uh, unique vantage point. So uh, Phil and I have been given the difficult task uh, to present an overview of this 21 chapter, 600 page book in about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so we will try to be brief and we will be talking fast. So the book is uh, divided in four parts. Uh, the first part is uh, devoted to the analytical framework uh, that underpins most of the analysis in the book. Um, which is followed by uh, a detailed account of uh, the buildup of vulnerabilities prior to the crisis in uh, part two. Part three presents the policy response during the crisis, and then part four uh, highlights the fiscal challenges lying ahead and concludes with some policy lessons uh, that uh, Phil will be presenting. So let me perhaps go very quickly through the key issues that are covered in each of the four parts. 
as I mentioned, for part one provides the analytical underpinning of the book. In particular, it provides an intuitive uh, framework of rollover risk, a key risk going forward for many econo economies, particularly advanced economies. It also presents analytical insights into the challenge of bringing debt levels to more sustainable uh, levels by looking at uh, uh, two particular relationships that play significant uh, an important role uh, in uh, the book. The first one is uh, the uh, component of the dynamic equation. Uh, for instance, uh, the famous R minus G, which is the difference between the interest rate on public debt and the growth rate of uh, the economy. And uh, the other factor, of course, that enters the, the dynamic equation is the primary balance. So we look at uh, the determinants of uh, those two uh, important uh, factors that determine the dynamic, uh, uh, the dynamic equation for that. We also look at the relationship between debt over GDP uh, ratio and growth. Uh, and the idea here is to look at, to try to assess the, um, uh, the extent of the debt overhang on growth. Uh, I guess the upshot from this analysis is that the debt overhang problem and the unfavorable global environment uh, where interest rates are likely to, to increase and also growth to remain relatively subdued, uh, those factors will conspire to make uh, fiscal consolidation quite difficult. Um, another issue that is more recent, which is the deflationary pressures, uh, particularly in Europe, if they were to intensify, would of course also uh, hamper fiscal consolidation. So quickly, part two uh, reviews the buildup of vulnerabilities and highlight uh, significant differences in pre-crisis fiscal positions in advanced economies, emerging market, and low-income countries. It uh, documents the slow buildup of vulnerabilities in advanced economies and in particular, it identifies the roots of the problem in the, in the uh, oral area. Uh, both macroeconomic, uh, highlighting both macroeconomic uh, weaknesses as well as structural weaknesses, and also shows that tax policy may have contributed to the crisis by uh, encouraging leverage and uh, risk taking. Emerging markets and low-income countries were in a relatively better position in the period leading to the crisis. Uh, in emerging market, uh, the main reason is perhaps that um, the um, markets have been, uh, they, they, they were subject to uh, much more market discipline than, than other countries, which um, led them essentially to uh, uh, to some important restructuring, uh, restru uh, reform, uh, uh, reforms, and as well as uh, strengthening of their fiscal position. Low-income countries also um, end up with a stronger fiscal position uh, before the crisis, um, thanks to stronger growth uh, underpinned by some uh, uh, so some uh, reforms, uh, but also from commodity prices, which were relatively favorable. Of course, the debt relief helped as well. The, this part also tried to put the current crisis in her historical perspective by looking at uh, episodes of uh, debt accumulation and their subsequent uh, reduction, um, looking at a very long span of data, uh, more than 100 years for several countries. And uh, the emphasis is to look at um, whether the factors that underpinned uh, successful uh, fiscal consolidation episodes are operative in uh, the current context. Part three provides an in-depth analysis of the timing, size, and composition of the fiscal stimulus, and also discusses issues related to uh, its implementation. The book also looks at the nature of the public support uh, to the financial system. Um, uh, com compared to previous uh, crisis episodes, uh, the authorities seem to have opted this time around 
to a policy of containment uh, through provision of central bank liquidity and uh, guarantees of uh, banks' liabilities rather than uh, restructuring banks' uh, assets. This policy may have actually postponed the real cost of the crisis and also uh, may have delayed the recovery. Another issue that is covered in this part is uh, the fiscal challenges at the subnational government uh, level using disaggregated data for eight emerging and advanced economies. And what the data shows is that many of the subnational governments have been hit by double whammy. Uh, a sharp decline in own revenues uh, due, for example, to a decline in taxes from real estate. Uh, but also a decline in transfers from the central government after an initial increase due to the fiscal stimulus. Some of that decline in revenue is likely to be permanent, and therefore uh, subnational government will, of course, have to adjust spending accordingly. The Great Recession has also revived the debate uh, surrounding the size of fiscal multipliers. Uh, there is increasing new evidence showing that uh, fiscal multi multipliers tend to be asymmetric over the business cycle. That is, multipliers tend to be higher during period of, uh, of uh, recession, particularly if the recession is severe, and also if monetary policy is accommodative. Uh, these findings have important implication for uh, fiscal adjustment plans. Uh, in particular, they suggest that uh, if, the, if the country can afford it, in other words, if market allow it, they should opt for a more gradual adjustment plan rather than front-loaded one. Finally, part four uh, covers the fiscal outlook and risk and highlights both short-term and long-term fiscal challenges and uh, risk to fiscal sustainability. <laughs> the, the crisis has left many countries, particularly advanced economies, with a legacy of high debt. Um, in 2014, we have just reached a stabilization. The, the fiscal consolidation that has been ongoing for a while has just stabilized that. So there is quite a bit uh, to be done to put uh, debt, debt ratios on a downward path. The dynamics look slightly better in emerging markets, but they are predicated, at least in the scenarios that we have run, on a relatively positive global environment, one in which uh, interest rates are likely to remain low, uh, certainly uh, lower than the pre-crisis level, and also that uh, growth, although subdued, will continue to strengthen over time. Um, so risk to both advanced and emerging markets are apparent, and uh, they include, of course, uh, policy implementation risk, uh, uh, worsening of the macroeconomic environment, and also uh, adjustment fatigue, uh, particularly in advanced economies. So the path for escaping head debt is quite narrow and is likely to be a lengthy one, and there are unfortunately no uh, shortcuts. Uh, in the past, uh, government have used financial repression uh, to reduce debt uh, in the current context of a globalized financial market, it's very difficult uh, to achieve a, a captive investor base uh, to have any meaningful ga gains from uh, financial repression. Debt restructuring uh, is also an option. Uh, however, in some circumstances, it may be, um, it may be unavoidable, uh, but it has its own cost, uh, particularly if the investor base is mainly domestic. So the, uh, I guess this leaves us with one option and one option only in terms of uh, reducing debt, which is a um, fiscal consolidation, and of course accompanied by structural reform to boost growth, which plays a, a critical uh, role in bringing that level uh, to a sustainable, a sustainable um, uh, level. Um, central banks can, of course, help by running a monetary policy that is relatively accommodative, if possible, uh, and also making, ensuring that uh, uh, financial stability and credit channels are working appropri appropriately. Uh, 
then the, the book asks um, what institutional reform are necessary to uh, help achieve the required fiscal adjustment. And they have, here there have been quite a few innovations. I will cite a few. One is that there is new fiscal rules that are designed to um, respond to the business cycle, uh, in particular by allowing, for instance, automatic stabilizers to operate during period of recession. Uh, this new feature, by the way, is now embedded in the, uh, the European Compact. There is also a growing number of independent uh, fiscal councils, which are aimed to enhance uh, fiscal accountability and transparency, and um, uh, ultimately uh, distill more fiscal discipline. These new institutions have been backed by public financial manage uh, management reforms, um, particularly uh, reforms that try to strengthen the fiscal framework and also giving it a more uh, medium-term orientation. However, these reforms obviously are no panacea. At the end, uh, the authorities' ownership, the government ownership of these reforms remains key for success. So beyond the, um, beyond the, the uh, adjustment uh, plans uh, that have been put in place now for a few years, Many countries still need to put in place reforms to rein in the uh, spending related to, uh, age, to uh, health care and, and uh, pensions. In fact, uh, a recent study by the IMF shows, that, shows projections over the next two decades that um, uh, spending in, on health care and pension is likely to increase by three and a half percentage point of GDP in advanced economies and about two percentage points in emerging market, if that were to, to happen, uh, that would, of course, weaken uh, significantly the fiscal position, which is already uh, quite weak. So I think I will stop here, uh, given that uh, we are running out of time, and I will uh, turn the floor over to uh, Phil to conclude with some policy lessons. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, as a number of speakers have already noted, this is a very long book, clocking in at um, close to 600 pages. So I hope there are lots and lots of lessons from it. Um, I'm not going to try to cover all of them. I'm going to focus on a few key ones. And I should also say that the crisis is still having an effect on economies around the world, and we're still, I hope, learning from it. So this, the list of, of lessons that I'm about to give it's first of all, not expect, I don't intend for it to be a comprehensive list, and it's not the last word by any means. I think we're continuing to grow. We're, we'll still get new lessons. Our understanding of the lessons that we, that we draw already may be affected by future developments. But I did at least want to try to tie together uh, many of the, the many chapters in the book and try to get some lessons for fiscal policymakers going forward. Um, So let me begin with that. And the, the first lesson, which now seems obvious but was not obvious before the crisis, is that even advanced economies can have debt crises. Prior to the crisis, there was a lot of discussion about safe debt levels for emerging market economies. And there was a feeling that debt ratios above 40 or 50 percent of GDP might, be, might leave countries prone to risks. But there wasn't a similar number for advanced economies. There was a lot of work that acknowledged that high debt ratios in advanced economies would raise interest rates and were bad for growth. But they didn't have, people didn't draw the implication from that that there was a risk of a fiscal crisis as a result of high debt levels. So one of the lessons from the crisis that, perhaps the most obvious lesson from the crisis, is that even advanced economies can have debt, debt crises, that there is for advanced economies a debt ratio at which point markets begin to doubt the sustainability of fiscal policy. We don't yet have a consensus on what that level is. You look at countries like the U.S. and Japan that have managed to hum along quite nicely with debt ratios around 100 percent of GDP or more, while other advanced economies have gotten into trouble with much lower ratios. But I think one lesson that does come from the crisis is that even advanced economies can reach a point where debt is so high that markets begin to doubt the sustainability of fiscal policy and a fiscal crisis ensues. The second lesson that comes from the crisis is that advanced economies did not do as good a job as they probably should have in saving during good times. And there are, I think, two reasons for this. One is the standard sort of human nature of political economy argument that it's hard to save money. Um, it's hard to cut spending or keep spending down. It's hard to avoid cutting taxes when money is plentiful. So you have this tendency in democracies that the deficits that countries run during bad times aren't offset by surpluses during good times. But 
and that argument is well understood. But I think there's a second argument, too, which is that many advanced economies didn't perceive how good the good times were when they were good. In many advanced economies, fiscal positions were inflated by high asset prices, by the strength of particular sectors in the economy that may have been especially tax rich, like the financial sector. And there wasn't a good technique. The techniques that macroeconomists and fiscal economists tend to use to, to account for the effects of the cycle didn't capture those very well. And so economists may have entered the crisis, or policymakers may have entered the crisis with a sense that fiscal policy was much stronger than it actually was. And indeed, a lot of the work that's being done now in, in the Fiscal Affairs Department and the IMF and elsewhere is to try to take better account of those cyclical factors to give policymakers a better sense of what's actually going on in the underlying fiscal accounts so that they have a better sense of what will happen when the bubble finally bursts. A third lesson that comes, which is related to that first lesson, is that sometimes no buffer is big enough. Um, there were some advanced economies, I, I think of Ireland in particular, um, that entered the crisis with what seemed like very low levels of debt, um, but nevertheless ran into crises. Um, there had in the past been some effort to take into account the effect of explicit government guarantees on the fiscal position. But the implicit liabilities that come from a financial sector that's too big to fail weren't really looked at very rigorously. So one of the lessons that, that comes through from the fiscal crisis is that we need to take much better account of the implicit fiscal liabilities that are out there. Um, while large, moreover, while larger buffers are always better, right? It's always better to have a bigger buffer before the crisis to offset what might happen. There are some countries where the financial sector is so big that it's probably not plausible to think that a government could set aside a nest egg big enough to cover a crisis. Again, in a country like Ireland where the financial sector is many multiples of GDP, it's just not plausible that a country could set aside a fiscal buffer for a rainy day in the event of a financial sector shock. Um, so one lesson that comes from that, too, is that better macroprudential policy, better financial sector regulation is an offset, is an outshoot of fiscal policy as well. Uh, at the same time, given that financial sector policies can minimize risks but can't eliminate them, it's an open question whether or not some advanced economies may want to think about setting an upper limit on the size of their financial sector as a way to protect themselves from the fiscal risks that would come from a shock. There are several other lessons that come through from the book. I'm going to move through very quickly because, as Abdel mentioned, we're running short on time and, and we do want to leave time for the panel. So I'll go through them very quickly. Um, one lesson is that growth is the spoonful of sugar that can help bring down debt ratios more quickly over time. And the impact comes from, from two things. It comes from a denominator effect, because obviously the higher is GDP, the lower is the debt to GDP ratio. And it comes from a numerator effect, because as, as work in the IMF has shown, countries that grow faster tend to run larger primary surpluses over time. So the sort of standard measures that we think about to promote growth, reforms to the labor market, uh, reforms to, to the retail sector, reforms to the financial sector to, to promote growth of credit, these are all things that can help bring down the debt ratio over time. And so we need to think about those as being offshoots of fiscal policy as well. Um, that just as important as the growth rate or the debt ratio is the interest rate that the economies face. Abdel spo spoke about that relationship between R minus G. And so it's important that countries do a good job of setting out their fiscal policy objectives, making sure that markets understand what it is that they're trying to do, and main keeping that medium-term path to ensure that, um, that they don't lose market confidence. Uh, that budget institutions matter, uh, and that in many advanced economies, they're not as good as they should be. Uh, many countries lack a sufficient medium-term focus in budgeting. Um, they lack an independent fiscal institute that can provide confidence about the, the realism of assumptions, um, and that uh, they lack adequate fiscal data. In many countries, data come late and are subject to large revision. And so in many advanced economies, there's a need to strengthen institutions to make sure that people have a better idea what's actually going on in the fiscal accounts. Um, that monetary integration means fiscal integration, too. Um, that if you have monetary integration, you need a sufficient degree of fiscal integration to guard you against the impact, to guard against the impact not just of idiosyncratic shocks, but also of idiosyncratic policies. That when it comes to fiscal policy, the recipe is likely to be, as it almost always is, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Some measures on the revenue side and some measures on the expenditure side. The exact recipe, of course, is going to depend on country characteristics, but in general, the higher the revenue ratio, the more countries need to rely on the expenditure side. The higher is spending, the more countries need to rely on, on the revenue side. 
But the final point that I want to make um, is that, as with Mark Twain, the rumors of fiscal policy's death were greatly exaggerated. There was a feeling before the crisis that monetary policy was the primary short-run stabilization tool and that the objectives of fiscal policy were primarily medium and longer run in, in orientation. And what the crisis has shown is that there are circumstances where fiscal policy can play an important short-term stabilization role. And this reflects to some extent the, the unique circumstances of the crisis. With many countries already at or near the zero lower bound, there was very little room for fiscal policy to play a countercyclical role, and so they had to turn to, to fiscal policy. Um, but at the same time, work that has been done in the IMF and in the Fiscal Affairs Department, as reported in this book, shows that the particular circumstances that we found ourselves in at the crisis, with interest rates very low, with a large output gap, and with a financial sector that was, was not operating properly because of the crisis, that fiscal policy could be especially effective under those circumstances. Now, I don't think we would argue that going forward, fiscal policy should become the primary tool for short-run stabilization and replace monetary policy. And I think it's clear once interest rates return to a more normal level, to a level closer to, to their medium and, and historical norms, that monetary policy is going to have to pick back up the mantle of a short-run stabilization tool. But at the same time, I think the experience of the crisis has shown us that under certain circumstances, and circumstances that exist not just in the footnote to an intermediate macro textbook, but in the real world that we all inhabit, that there is on occasion a role for fiscal policy to play a countercyclical role. So with that, uh, let me wrap up this portion of the program and turn it over to the panel. But thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. And now we have our panel, and I invite the participants of the panel. We'll have a very interesting panel, so I'll be extremely brief. We'll have, and they will discuss the book and the challenges of fiscal policy for six minutes, about six minutes, and then we'll go for Q&A, and they will wrap up and, and answer. We have Carlo Cotarelli, who is one of the co-authors, but he's no longer in the fund, so they didn't want to invite him to talk. I think. He's the commissioner of public spending reform. You could say, well, that's easy job, but he's in Italy. So that that's, that's make it very difficult job. He was director of the Fiscal Affairs Department from November 2008 to 2013, and he had a very distinguished career since 1988 at the IMF. Uh, so, and before he was at the Bank of Italy. So he's... Uh, was at the mid of the IMF discussions uh, during the crisis. Then we have uh, Vito Gaspar, which we, is, the, is the new director of the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department since June this year. Now, I think that the most impressive uh, uh, thing that he has done, he was Minister of Finance of Portugal from 2011 to 2013. I don't need to remind you what happened in Portugal those years, so he was not just courageous, but was very successful a, a finance minister, and, and, and now we hope uh, he'll have the same success at the fund. We have the Maya Maginez, who is a very well known for all of us, especially for those of you that live here, you know, in the, she's a, a regular contributor to issues like health, economic, tax, budget policy, one of the most uh, influential persons in, in fiscal policy here in Washington. And finally, we'll have uh, Adam Posen, who is the president of the Peterson Institute. Being a fellow at the Institute, I cannot say it's not crazy that I say that it's a world-leading independent think tank on economic and globalization. I believe it, but, but, but I should say it. So, and Adam is, <clears throat> is, of course, a great economist and also policymaker. During the crisis, he was, a, he was a, an, an external member of the Bank of England, Monetary Policy Setting Committee, so he has also broad experience not only in the academic side, but also on the, on the policy side, and also during the, the crisis, he was in, in, in the middle of one of the, of the most important places uh, running uh, monetary policy. So now we'll start with Carlo, and, and we'll give them some minutes to, to talk and, and to discuss this. You can pick whatever you want, prefer to talk. Okay, my thanks first of all to the Peterson Institute, to Adam for hosting this. 
to Jose for these uh, nice words uh, of, uh, of introduction. This book uh, was uh, written during the last year when I was uh, heading the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF, uh, as uh, Jose mentioned, since uh, October 23rd, 2013, I've taken up uh, the position of Commissioner for Public Spending Reform in Italy, which is a slightly more challenging job than the one I had before, I think. Um, but it's tough, uh, to t uh, it's tough to cut public spending in all countries, but perhaps, uh, again, as uh, Jose was noting, it's uh, perhaps a bit tougher in Italy. Uh, as uh, as you know, a heated debate a, a heated debate is going on uh, in Europe uh, at the moment and in the world about uh, the extent uh, to which uh, concerns about uh, low growth should be considered as more important than concerns about fiscal discipline. Uh, this debate, uh, if you can call it the austerity debate, uh, has been going on for quite uh, a while and it's very much at the, at the heart of the book uh, that uh, is being uh, pr has been presented is being presented today in europe uh, is take this debate of the austerity the austerity debate is taking a particular connotation uh, in terms of uh, uh, flexibility debate uh, how much uh, the european rules uh, the rules under the fiscal compact uh, the Stability and Growth Pact should uh, become should become more flexible to take into account uh, the need uh, for for growth. Uh, there is clearly a need uh, to reconcile this need for growth and the need uh, for fiscal uh, stability. And the point that I will make uh, today uh, is that there is quite a lot that you can uh, do to reconcile the need for flexibility and the need for policy, fiscal policy that support uh, growth without really changing the existing rules, but simply by interpreting the rule in a more, uh, in a smarter way than what is happening now. Uh, I'll talk about pretty um, technical points also, but these details, technical details, but these details are, uh, are important. Uh, the first point, indeed, I want to make is uh, relates to one way in which the Stability and Growth Pact and the um, Fiscal Compact try to reconcile the need for uh, fiscal discipline with the need for uh, uh, flexibility. And one key way in which the Stability and Growth Pact tries to do this is uh, by focusing uh, the policy making and the policy makers on uh, improvements in the so-called structural uh, balance uh, of uh, the fiscal accounts. That is uh, the, the balance adjusted for cyclical effect. So you don't target uh, a, a headline improvement in the deficit, you target uh, a structural improvement uh, in the deficit. So this is important because uh, if the economy is hit by a shock, uh, you essentially are allowed to let uh, the automatic uh, stabilizers uh, operate and therefore you let uh, um, the fiscal policy to play a supportive role uh, without uh, uh, removing the trend, the improvement uh, in the fiscal account, which is uh, related to the, structure, uh, the improvement in the structural uh, deficit. Uh, this is a approach uh, is fine and uh, we have been arguing at the fund that uh, targeting structural uh, the structural deficit improving the structural deficit is critical but uh, given uh, the way uh, the european union and others uh, uh, compute uh, potential growth and from this day derive the structural deficit. Even given the way we compute the effect of the cyclical position of the economy on the fiscal account, given this way there are some problems uh, in this approach. This approach uh, is good for regular recessions, for regular business cycles in which uh, the economy grows uh, for one or two years, then you have a recession, the growth rate declines. Uh, but it's not working well uh, for uh, 
strong for long for the long recession the long kind of recessions uh, Europe has been uh, been affected uh, been fallen into since the 2007 uh, crisis the reason is that in practice uh, no matter how sophisticated the underlying statistical model are uh, potential growth is uh, strongly influenced by backward-looking observation about actual growth therefore uh, potential growth appears uh, to be particularly low uh, in many european countries now uh, i think it is estimated to be close to zero in italy so potential growth for italy now is regarded by the commission uh, as a zero i think the actual number for 2013 was slightly negative minus 0.1 uh, percent and this implies that uh, if uh, a country like Italy, uh, which is zero potential growth, has an even modest recovery, this is regarded to be a booming economy. So, for example, if uh, next year Italy were projected to grow by one uh, and... Uh, yeah, I'm going to speak a bit more than one minute. Uh, if Italy is uh, uh, supposed uh, is projected to grow by say 1.3%, 1.4%, against the potential growth of zero, this is seen as a booming economy. And therefore, this calls for a very strong fiscal adjustment in terms of headline balances. I think one can easily compute that uh, given the relationship between growth and the deficit and given the relationship uh, and given the structural improvement uh, the improving the structural deficit that a country like Italy is supposed to have, if growth next year in Italy were 1.3%, 1.4%, in Italy or any other country in this situation, uh, the improvement in the nominal balance would have to be of the order of 1, 1.5%. Uh, which, taking into account even modest multipliers, uh, would have significant effects on growth, and therefore this will not uh, materialize. So I think there is uh, this problem needs to be looked at uh, very uh, closely, uh, and it can be done without any major change in the stability and growth pack, without any major change in uh, uh, in the fiscal compact. It's a technical issue, but these technical issues are are very important. I know I don't have much time, but I want to make one last uh, point. The one way to incorporate uh, these uh, effects of potential, uh, one way of taking into account the potential growth should not be based only on backward looking uh, information, is by considering that structural reforms, the structural reforms we all want, the structural reforms that we are all pushing for, have uh, an impact. Uh, in the data, in the way we compute these things on potential growth. So there is a need, of, I think, of taking into account, as long as you define the, um, in, in a clear way the structural reforms that you want to implement, there is a need of uh, uh, incorporating your estimates of potential growth, the reforms that you are undertaking. And this is not uh, done at the moment. I think this is very important to be done um, in the future to avoid this uh, uh, very strange situation in which a country undertakes a structural reforms, comes from a period of very slow growth and is penalized therefore as long as one shows that uh, uh, the these reforms are having an effect on the economy and the economy is expected uh, to grow. Because the current approach is to mistake what is uh, a recovery in potential growth with a cyclical recovery of the economy which would call for a strong fiscal adjustment. I will stop at this point. I've taken too much of my time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vitor. So I want to uh, start by thanking the Peterson Institute and Adam Posen to, um, for putting together this session, uh, Jose for his uh, kind words of uh, introduction and especially the editors and authors of the book uh, for uh, putting uh, together w a book which is definitely a uh, very uh, important contribution to the literature on fiscal policy. The book brings together an impressive compilation of 21 papers by 45 authors 
with a multifaceted view on fiscal policy in the global crisis. The book's coverage is impressive, ranging from the conduct of fiscal policy before 2007 to the challenges ahead and the lessons learned. It is, and I repeat, a major contribution to the literature on fiscal policy. I will now argue that the issues covered in the book are going to be of lasting relevance. Fiscal policy is, in my view, going to be at the center of micro and macro policymaking for a long time. But since I'm supposed to be short, I will limit myself to a few remarks. FAD is conducting research on fiscal adjustment episodes. The research by uh, Julio Escolano and co-authors covers uh, 91 consolidation episodes selected from the period from 1945 until 2012 and covers uh, 30 advanced economies and 60 developing economies. Adjustment uh, episodes are identified by the authors based on two criteria. First, the need for adjustment. Second, the willingness by the authors to carry out the required policy actions. They find that corrections in the cyclically adjusted uh, primary balance are sizable. They are also lasting. They suffice to stabilize the public debt to GDP ratios, but not to reduce them. On average, for the 91 episodes of adjustment covered by the sample, the public debt to GDP ratio stabilized about 15 percentage points of GDP above pre crisis levels, pre-fiscal crisis levels. Interestingly, the available information on fiscal policy action points to the present danger of a repeat of adjustment fatigue. This point is all the more important because in the decades previous to the global crisis, there was a great public debt accumulation in advanced economies. More specifically, Abbas and co-authors in chapter 7 of the book documented the weighted average increase in the period from 1970 to 2007. Uh, the debt during this period accumulated 45% of GDP and that the increase was gradual and enduring. Abdel had this reported in his presentation of the book. It is also worthwhile to look at the comparison between advanced and developing economies. From 2001 to 2013, the average debt to GDP ratio in advanced economies increased from 71.6% of GDP to 106.5%. During the same period, the, rele the relevant ratios for developing economies declined from 47.4 to 33.7. Given that the book quotes that the risk for, uh, fi uh, for public debt sustainability in uh, developing economies was believed to be in the range from 40 to 50 percent, these trends are remarkable. In the book, as Philip has said, the first, level, the, the first lesson is that no country advanced or developing can defy the law of gravity. That is, no country can safely ignore debt sustainability limits. Now, these global trends are also uh, important when one looks at GDP shares in world economy. During the period that I've, uh, that I've noted, the shares of world GDP in uh, developing and advanced economies have inverted. For uh, advanced economies, they moved from 58 to 42, uh, sorry, they were 58 and 42 percent respectively in 2001, and they inverted in uh, 2013 with 44 percent for advanced economies and 56 uh, percent for developing economies. The global landscape is definitely changing. One important and crucial driving force is population or demographics. Fertility rates have been declining and are now below the 2.1 replacement ratio in most advanced economies. Life expectancy is increasing. 
declining population and aging will have far-reaching consequences. Debt levels, unprecedented in peacetime, meet expenditure pressures on pensions and health. At the same time, the book also documents that fiscal policy will be called on to contribute to macroeconomic stability and as appropriate stabilization. As for FAD, work is progressing on how to conduct fiscal policy in the aftermath of the global crisis. Long-run drivers like population, technology, and natural resources feature prominently in ongoing research. After the crisis, the magnitude of the challenges and the quality of the contributions uh, to this book ensure that the book will stay at the center of the literature on fiscal policy for many years to come. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vito. And now we have Maya, please. Good, thank you. Um, it's very nice to be here this afternoon. I, I um, said this to Adam right before the lunch, but I always think that the, the Peterson Institute actually does the single best job um, of think tanks in this town, hands down, of having the best audience. And so I'm really excited to sort of have the discussion. Can, can I quote the first half of your sentence? <laughs> I'll quote it all, but I really like the first half. Sorry. <laughs> Um, no, I think the discussions that go on here are tremendous, so I'm excited to be here, and congratulations to the authors and co-authors of this book. Um, as somebody who works on fiscal policy in the U.S., I, I found the past years discouraging for a number of reasons, but one of them has been that the discussion has been so focused sort of on the policy problems, but it quickly degenerates or, or moves to the degenerating situation of politics in the U.S. And the fiscal discussion in the U.S. is really focused on how the political process no longer works. Um, many of the policies and solutions are sort of well known, um, and the question is how to get them done. So I found it really um, useful, exciting, and it kind of reminded me why I like fiscal policy so much to work through this book, uh, which is really a great pulling together of observations from where we were before, um, contributions, sort of new, new contributions to the literature, which um, really is in many ways sort of filled the best through the work of the IMF, but still needs so much more work, um, and some very sensible policy solutions that seem to apply to a number of countries, including the US. I'll talk just briefly, I'll use my few minutes just to talk about the situation in the US and link it to some of the observations from the book and, and what it prompted me to think about um, I think the situation in the U.S. is really interesting because in many ways right now we're suffering from deficit fatigue where the kind of political narrative is that the situation has been resolved as the deficit comes down. Um, and of course that's, that's far from reality. The debt projections are what always has been the troubling part. It hasn't been an annual deficit that people should be concerned about. It's the projections of the debt and they remain unsustainable. Um, and because so much of our ability to do policy is linked to where we are in the political cycle, this year being the midterm elections, it was kind of taken as a given that we would make no improvements. But I think one thing that really wasn't realized was just how much damage could actually get done this year. Um, and, and in our office, the kind of driving principle for the year was do no harm. Um, and with every policy that comes up, we, we sort of feel like we've lost another battle. And what's happening here is that you have all sorts of policies from unemployment insurance or fixing the, the sustainable growth rate, the doc fix, but one of the health care changes that gets made every year to new veterans benefits to tax extenders, all sorts of policies that are still being deficit financed. And I think because they tend to seem somewhat small or manageable at the time, most people haven't stopped and realized that what the U.S. is looking at in terms of new policies from kind of the first six months of the year alone would basically add another $2.3 trillion to the debt over the next decade, which is very significant. It's about uh, how much progress has been made recently. That would increase the overall debt at the end of the decade by over eight percentage points of GDP. So um, it looks like we're managing to do a good bit of harm. Um, and it's all frustrating because it's so well known and the, and the IMF and others lay out what's necessary, what we need, which is a medium term consolidation plan. The U.S. is very lucky. We have the luxury um, of continuing to be the safe haven for some reason, which allows us to do this on a gradual timetable. Um, and yet the policies that we've done so far are in many ways backwards. 
again, sort of the progress on the deficit is both the re result of an improving economy, but also some policy changes. But I would argue that they were the absolute reverse of what should have happened. Um, on the revenue side, and I, I sort of take it as a given that the medium-term consolidation plan we need would include both, both revenues and spending. But on the revenue side, we increased tax rates in this country when clearly there's such an opportunity for tax reform that could be pro-growth, simplify the tax code, help with competitiveness, and raise revenues. And we went for increasing rates instead. Um, and there's a real pushback on reducing rates as part of fundamental tax reform, even if you kept the tax burdens the same, um, I think for more political reasons than economic reasons. And then on the spending side, clearly we've had this just absurd politically driven policy sequester, which was a mechanism that was put in place. We've talked, the IMF has talked a lot about fiscal triggers. The sequester was meant to be one of those triggers that was so stupid you would never let it hit. And then here we are, because the political the system is such that nobody wanted to make choices to replace it, we let it hit. You know, we put a little breathing room in the change at the end of last year, but still the sequester's in place. Meanwhile, we've done nothing to deal with the aging problems. We are making, it looks like, some progress in controlling health care costs, but honestly don't really know how much those are permanent, sustainable changes. There's still a whole lot more to be done. So um, it's pretty frustrating, I think, when you look at changes that in some way make you feel that the problem's not as large or many people in the public think the problem's not as charged, but actually as large as it is, and many of those changes have probably done um, some real damage to the economy in the short term, too much consolidation quickly, and not the kind of changes that will grow over time. Um, I also think that the U.S. could learn a lot from what a lot of other countries do much better, but much better transparency in their fiscal situation. One of the things that we've seen is that fiscal consolidation plans that work and stay on track tend to do so when the public understands what's going on and can hold government uh, officials accountable. The U.S. has an incredibly non-transparent um, budgeting system. And we, we ran a commission a couple years ago that basically came up with what we call the three T's, but the need to increase on the budget front by putting uh, budget transparency, coupled with the need to have fiscal targets, which is something we don't have in the U.S., and fiscal triggers, something that would automatically make changes when we're off course. Um, there has not been much improvement on any of those fronts yet. So then just kind of switching to some of the, the book's recommendations and how you link them to the U.S., I think one of the things that's really interesting is um, how so many of the countries suffer from the exact same challenges, but the, the lack of progress we've made on dealing with aging, um, the fact that we're going to be uh, so harmed by the growing interest costs. I mean, interest is the single fastest growing part of the budget right now, and that's in a low-rate environment, so we're incredibly vulnerable to changes in that. Um, and in the U.S. still, the lack of political will, even responding to kind of the clear-cut paths. We had the Simpson-Bowles Commission here in the U.S. that laid out the kind of path that would put us on the right track, but the inability to work with those. Um, so finally, just quickly, um, so many good recommendations in this book. Um, I do think um, that the focus on fiscal consolidation with structural changes that will promote growth is the key to this whole thing. Um, in many ways, it often so kind of falls in a camp here where it's excessive consolidation or austerity or focusing on short-term deficit reduction or kind of the pie in the sky, we can grow our way out of the problem. When clearly you have the need for the medium-term plan coupled with the real changes that will help promote growth, uh, and both of their, them are going to be necessary to tackle this, cha this challenge. I think on the recommendation or the acknowledgement that we need to do much more with aging, um, I'm incredibly worried about where the U.S. stands on that. If you look at the political promises that come out from the government, sort of the single most um, widespread and strong promise out there is that whenever people start to talk about policy changes to our entitlements, health care and retirement systems, and then they quickly back away. But when they do, the one promise they make is not to touch anybody over 55. And that promise has been in place for over 10 years now, um, but that, that number is not changing. So we have the baby boom moving into retirement. We're not looking at any of the, the promises that could be things that you know, promise to come up with policies that help promote growth or protect people who depend on programs. It's all about protecting people who are over 55. So the policies that will most help us be more flexible and um, work with an aging population, I'm worried, bump up against the political realities. Um, and finally, I've always really been drawn to a lot of the recommendations about changes in fiscal councils. In one way, the U.S. does such great work on this because our institution, the Congressional Budget Office, is a great model. Um, it is a model that's used around the world. But 
you sometimes kind of want to figure out how you could free up CBO so that they could actually have some more opinions. Because I always think um, the CBO knows a lot of the answers. They know what to do. And is there a way to build a council that is used um, kind of as a credible source that makes recommendations so fiscal policy isn't as politicized? The challenge there, of course, is that once you give that power to independent council beyond just analysis but to have opinions, they lose their credibility because one side is, or both sides usually, is always whining that they, they're picking the other side. So I think the real challenge is how, um, in a time when there's no political will to make the kinds of changes that need to happen, you could have an impartial body be able to push, nudge uh, policymakers in the right direction. So I'll, I'll finish there. But again, I think my biggest takeaway from these overall recommendations and concern at the same time is how important it is to think about policies that both focus on fiscal consolidation and structural reforms that promote growth, whereas in the U.S., we, one, do very little to focus on the long term. Like, if you look at how we look at our budget, there's very little recognition or acknowledgement of when you put a policy in place, what will those changes look like five years from now, 10 years from now, and even in the second decade? So I think that's an area that's important to, to build out, how we can focus on the long term. And in the U.S., I think there's a real risk that what we do is we muddle along. We make changes that are just big enough, um, and if the past is any, any indication, perhaps, that are in the easiest part of the budget, but not the best, best part of the budgets, but just big enough so that we don't have like the real risk of a fiscal crisis, but they're not smart, they don't help the economy grow more, the fiscal situation doesn't improve as much as it should, and we kind of get stuck there way below the potential of what we could be. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Now we have Alan Pusson. Uh, I, I will try to set an example of brevity, not that my colleagues here didn't, but various previous people on this stage and other occasions, I'll try to live up to it. But thank you to Jose for stepping in and adding a, a distinguished senior perspective on this. And we're very grateful to the IMF and to Carlo, and, and particularly to Phil and to Abdel, who came to us and said we could have this kind of substantive rollout and kind of challenging discussion here, and we're very proud to give the IMF that forum and to give this critical bridge which Maya has made for us, as I hoped she would, to the U.S. debate as well. So I think this is really terrific and true congratulations to Abdel and Phil for assembling an amazing piece of work. I want to also though, welcome my friend Vitor Gaspar back to Washington and I think coming on the heels of this project I think is a great example because there was probably no issue that was as fraught for the IMF to reconsider as the fiscal policy religion that it had promulgated and to a degree excessively proselytized for a very long time. And for the fund to in real time or as close to real time as you could get um, be dealing with issues, be dealing with evidence, reopening questions and doing so in an intellectually honest way, I think is praiseworthy. And I think it gives the, actually gives the Fiscal Affairs Department more credibility now than when it was the knee jerk, it's mostly fiscal stereotype that used to be. And I'm sure there are people in this room who will say things weren't that bad, and I, I, I recognize that, but I think it is worthy of us all noting the initiatives under Carlo, under everybody that this fund took and the Fiscal Affairs Department took, particularly on the issues of multipliers, on the issues of the short-term trade-offs, on reestablishing a credible framework for thinking about sustainability rather than simple triggers. All of these were significant, intellectually honest, and important progress for them to make, which only adds to the credibility of the re remaining advice that they are giving. So kudos to you guys for doing that. I think one of the things that is underappreciated, even if from today's presentations, that came out in some of Phil's opening presentation, is that we have to think a lot more about the financial system fiscal policy link. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter in recent years about <laughs> rethinking the fiscal, f the monetary financial system link, but I think the fiscal financial system link is very important. And it runs in multiple directions. As was mentioned, tax policy on leverage and on debt played a key role in building the imbalances of the crisis. Um, public support for the financial system, as was seen in be it Ireland or Iceland or the UK or Spain, plays a material difference in how you, how you end up in these debt situations. I think 
we talk a lot, rightly, as, as Maya and others have pointed out, about aging and demographics, but I think we have been too long ignoring and downplaying the financial aspects of too big to fail of having very large financial systems in your countries. And I think that's in there, but I would commend the fund for raising this, or not the fund, the authors, I should say. And I would emphasize that more, actually, than it's currently been done. I also think the initial part one is the sort of analytical framework. It starts with Carlo and co-authors chapters on sustainability. And we released last week a new book by Bill Klein on the euro area debt crisis, which does a similar, I think, constructive thing. Both of them are trying to think, okay, let's be a little more realistic about the co-movements of growth and debt. Let's not just make it a short-term thing and let's not just ignore that. Let's look at how these may vary together in not trivial ways, which I think is incredibly important. Um, third, I think Invitor, of course, has unique capability to talk about this, but we're kind of hoping Carlo manages to get to talk about this, and that is capacity for austerity. Um, I think for all the talk, and I've been on, on this debate about you're not wanting to overdo austerity in part because of the previous point, the issues of spillovers, the asymmetries of multipliers, the problems when everybody's contracting at once, I think it is reasonable to say that the democracy gets to rule. And if there is a sufficient coalition for austerity, who am I to say don't do it? And as my colleagues Jacob Kierkegaard and Anders Asland in this building have repeatedly pointed out and Vitor lived, it is surprising looking at the European crisis how much political will and sustainable support there's been for austerity. And I think we have to acknowledge that and take that into account when we think about planning going forward. I was a little surprised it was thrown up there in one of the initial slides saying financial repression is not an option. Um, it may not be an option that the Fiscal Affairs Department wants to talk about or, or encourage, but I think we have to realistically, when you look at Japan or you look at Italy or you look at a host of countries through the last decades, that various forms of financial repression light have mattered. And since, to repeat something I say regularly, one person's financial repression is another person's prudential supervision, it's not entirely necessarily an, an object you want to ignore. So I would, I would put that in the mix. So all that is great, and I mean it very sincerely. I think this is a huge step forward, and in terms of what it represents of our thinking in the world and the fund is a great step forward. I do want to raise, however, beyond encouraging more of these financial fiscal links and thinking about those, I want to raise four other issues that I think are, are not quite where I think we need to be. The first is we're still talking, and a number of my colleagues' presentations today, still talking as though there is a sort of debt trigger level. Now, I mean, the 90% debt myth has been successfully killed for good reason. I think the closest we came to something sensible on this was, I think, during Abdel's point that you know, there are some advanced economies that get into trouble at 80% of GDP, and there are some advanced economies that go yodi do at 120% of GDP. And it is debt to GDP, excuse me. Um, I think it, it's inconvenient truth, as they say, to, to acknowledge this fact. As Joe Gagnon here and many others have pointed out, it may have a little bit of something to do with whether or not you have your own currency. And it may have a little bit of something to do with whether or not you're large, and and those two go together. <laughs> and and you know, for a fund with 100 billion members, that may not be a comfortable conditional statement to make. But I think it is a bit misleading to start to keep talking as though it's a conditional statement on the level of GDP, level of debt to GDP, which is, leads to my second point. I think and this is not a criticism in any way of the book, but it is, a, it is a fact we have to all contend with who care about this issue. Financial market discipline really still doesn't work. Whether it's, whether it's subzones within China or whether it's subzones within the Euro area, we still have very great problems seeing financial markets properly price variations in risk over time and across space. 
And absent that, that's when we get into all the things that my colleagues, by implication, that's why we need the fiscal councils and the fiscal authorities and the rules and the so on. But we have to be not yet giving up. We have to think about what is it we could do to get a more reasonable budget response, excuse me, uh, market response to these budget differences. Some people would argue that for all the faults of the US fiscal system, which I completely defer to my and happen to agree with about, there is an issue that our state and local debt pricing is very important. Final, po final two points, quickly. I've always been a skeptic on the issue of fiscal rules. Um, I, I, I think they're well-intentioned, but I think they reflect politics at any given moment rather than having their own binding force. And I think that's why it's very fruitful that we talked earlier about automatic stabilizers. And I think that that is potentially the most important place we can try to make progress. Uh, our mutual colleague at the fund, Olivier Blanchard, many years ago at a conference here, um, spoke about the idea that automatic stabilizers don't have to be what we're given, we're not given by God. They're the accidental accumulation of, of policy decisions made through the years. And I pointed out back in 2005 on the Euro that the, finance, the automatic stabilizers were a little deficient at that point. I think that that's where we talk about in a sense, we want to do opportunistic budget consolidation. And we have to think about slipping in activist rules, activist stabilizers that force you. And maybe it includes, going back to the financial point, very aggressive real estate taxes that lean against the wind in that situation that also give you revenues. I don't know, but I think that as we move forward, I put less faith in the long-term fiscal councils or rules and more faith of building in some of these better stabilizers. But this is a wonderful debate and discussion to join. And again, I sincerely commend the Fiscal Affairs Department at the fund for doing such serious work in real time. Okay, thanks, Sam. We have still a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Uh, so if you can identify, and then we'll leave to the panel if they want to answer. Please, Teresa, and uh, here. The, 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 the microphone is coming, and please identify uh, who know you. Former director of the FAD, <laughs> pre pre predecessor of uh, Carlo. Thank you very much. This is a very impressive uh, book. I look forward to, to reading it uh, with great interest. I have a question for Carlo, actually. Uh, I really uh, sort of enjoyed your point uh, about the importance of uh, you know, taking into account uh, structural reforms in uh, uh, testing uh, the compliance with the EU fiscal rules. But you know very well, uh, I'm sure better than me, how difficult it is to translate this into you know, technically sound measures. Uh, uh, and how do you uh, assess the effects of uh, the uh, structural reforms on potential growth in a quantified way. Um, I mean, uh, this is particularly important when you have, uh, you know, sanctions and both reputational and, uh, and in the end, financial, potentially financial sanctions uh, for non-compliance with the rules. Thank you. Uh, we'll accumulate the questions in order to hear this and my question. Uh, thank you. I'm Randy Henning at American University, and I also wanted to follow up on, uh, on Carlo's uh, comments uh, about the methodology by which the cyclical adjustment uh, is, uh, is made uh, in, the, uh, in the assessment of, uh, of fiscal policy. Um, this is an important question because, of course, kind of European authorities will, will enforce um, uh, these rules in Europe under the fiscal compact on the basis of these calculations. And as Carlo mentioned, uh, there is a good deal of, uh, there's a fairly wide range in what we would regard as respectable estimates uh, of, the, uh, of the output gap. So the question is, what do we do when important institutions like uh, the European Commission and the International Monetary Fund uh, disagree on how that calculation should be made. It's hard to see, uh, well, let me put it this way, it's it, when there's disagreement, um, it, uh, 
it's quite possible that kind of the the uh, the authority, the moral authority of the European calculations could be undercut uh, by a uh, by a different position taken by the fund or the OECD or other institutions. So the question is. Um, what are you doing to anticipate uh, this uh, possibility? Uh, and I ask, uh, kind of thinking that on the one hand, we want to encourage cooperation among the institutions, but on the other hand, we don't want to encourage insular uh, group think. Thank you. We have the last two questions in the back. Hi, I'm uh, Lisa Doyle, and I'm speaking on my own behalf. I want to join the other two, um, inviting Carlo to uh, add to his already um, uh, informative comments. Carla, I wonder if you have uh, uh, an opinion about the proposals the fund has made recently about automatic sovereign debt restructuring, particularly from the perspective of Italy, either as a potential future restructurer itself or as collateral damage from such automatic restructuring done elsewhere in the euro area in future. In short, are these proposals undesirable, uh, unlikely? Thanks. So, uh, okay, my name is Patrick Welch of Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. I have one question to the whole panel. Uh, in last year, the IMF warned very drastically the United Kingdom against any austerity measures. I think the wording was, this is some kind of playing with fire and we're going to get a maybe we even get some kind of recession. And the IMF last year said, due to this announced austerity measures, that the growth in UK would be around 0.7 percentage points. Some weeks ago, Madame Lagarde accepted that the IMF was completely wrong and that the IMF has completely underestimated the confidence effects out of the austerity measures in the United K Kingdom. So I'm just wondering, what do we really know about how austerity is going to work in this reset, in this timing right after a huge recession, and maybe is, aren't the conf confidence effects much bigger than the IMF is willing to accept? Thank you very much. So now, all questions will work for Carlo, but then after Carlo answers, I will ask the rest of the panelists if they want to add something. Okay, uh, three points. Uh, it's clearly, there are difficulties, uh, as Teresa suggested uh, in her question, in uh, linking structural reforms to an estimate how, how much uh, potential growth will benefit from these uh, reforms. Uh, what the, the point uh, I was making, however, is twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, it's better to have uh, at least a minimum uh, assessment. Essentially, we now expect uh, Potential structural reform to have zero impact on potential growth, at least in these calculations, because potential growth is simply backward looking. Uh, and instead, uh, it, it is better to be to have a prudential estimate of the impact of potential growth, maybe just a quarter, 0.2 percent of GDP, than having zero, assuming that it is zero. I think it just doesn't make sense to assume that st you do structural reform to boost growth. And f in a forward looking, and what you do with potential growth, the only thing you do is to look at how much growth was in the past. That by, almost by definition is wrong. So we can do better than what we do. Uh, indeed, the second point I wanted to make is indeed that, that the approach that is currently followed is purely mechanical. Uh, and, and that clearly is unsatisfactory. And it leads to this paradoxical situation that any recovery is seen as a cyclical recovery rather than a return to more normal conditions uh, of, uh, of, uh, of potential growth, or basically acknowledging that uh, there was never such a huge drop in potential growth as it is implicit in these uh, estimates. Uh, on uh, the issue of uh, uh, debt restructuring, the point uh, that uh, the book uh, makes uh, is essentially one. And I don't want to comment about the, the specific proposal that was made by the IMF because I'm not really following the debate. I don't know enough about uh, how automatic this debt restructuring will be. So, but the point that the book makes about uh, debt uh, restructuring is that uh, very often debt restructuring is seen as uh, um, a way of avoiding fiscal adjustment. This is simply wrong. 
uh, debt restructuring is fiscal adjustment. You are taxing somebody, you are taxing the bondholders. So it's not true that uh, debt restructuring, oh, well, we're afraid about, uh, we're afraid of fiscal adjustment because this will affect the growth, and we do debt restructuring. Debt restructuring is a tax. It may be a tax uh, that falls partly on foreigners, but that is true only if uh, foreigners hold uh, your debt. If uh, your debt is held by your residents, then you are taxing your residents. And if uh, debt is uh, held uh, abroad, but uh, those who hold uh, debt are just your neighbors, your close neighbors, there are going to be feedback uh, effects uh, from taxing your neighbors. If the banking system of my neighbor gets into trouble, I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna have the uh, to, to to suffer the consequences of this. In other words, debt restructuring in Europe is not a debt restructuring uh, made by uh, a, 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 an emerging market countries uh, where the holders of debt are beyond the ocean. Uh, you are taxing your residents and you are taxing your neighbors and therefore you're going to suffer the recessionary effect of this tax as much as you're going to suffer from any fiscal adjustment in the short run. Uh, on, uh, on the UK, um, obviously it's not, uh, uh, I was uh, following from far away these comments that were made by Madame Lagarde about uh, the UK. At the time uh, uh, I was there, the Fiscal Affairs Department did uh, uh, take uh, the view that uh, what uh, the um, UK authorities were doing was not so inappropriate from uh, a fiscal adjustment point, uh, point of view. Uh, having said this, uh, it's never easy, obviously, to um, calibrate uh, the fiscal advice in a situation in which there is uh, a lot of uncertainty about what the growth uh, is expected to do. I think at the time uh, the IMF was uh, expecting much lower growth uh, than what it turned out to be uh, in, in the UK and as a result uh, the view that was taken at the time of the UK was be cautious with fiscal adjustment ex post uh, growth turned out to be to be higher so i think that was basically the story behind the, the policy advice that was given in the uk at the time carlo i don't know if uh, Vito, maya or adam want to add something B Vito? sure is this on okay um the uh, uh question that was asked uh uh, about the UK had a uh, general formulation at the end. How can we know uh, about the effects of fiscal policy? Now, that issue is obviously a hard one because the effects of uh, uh, fiscal policy depend not only on the connections of fiscal policy directly with the economy, but also on the impacts of fiscal policy on the expectations of the private sector. So clearly, at this point in time, uh, at the state of knowledge that we have, one has always to exercise uh, judgment when uh, looking at policy advice. I will very quickly move to two additional points to, that have to do with contributions that were made by uh, Adam and by Maya, and since uh, they will be speaking after me, that's, uh, that's fair. On Adam, one of the issues that Adam very much emphasized in his uh, comments was the role of automatic stabilizers. And I happen to agree that automatic stabilizers and the design of automatic stabilizers is likely to be one of the key topics of uh, uh, research on fiscal policy going forward. I do believe, however, that uh, automatic stabilizers are part of the characteristics of the fiscal policy regime and therefore are in a broad sense a part of the set of fiscal rules that Adam uh, said he disliked. And so I would very much uh, uh, appreciate a comment from Adam on uh, this point. On Maya and Adam, uh, in your presentations, uh, several times you emphasized the link 
between fiscal policy and uh, politics, sometimes in general, sometimes in connection with uh, the uh, U.S. situation. And I do happen to believe that that's another uh, topic where uh, research is likely to be needed going forward, that is, uh, being able to understand at a deeper, a deeper level, perhaps even being able to model the uh, uh, interaction between the economic science part of fiscal policy and the political aspects that seem to determine fiscal policy outcomes so often. Thanks, Vitor. Maya. Uh, well, boy, I'll just say those would be two terrific areas of, of further research for the fund. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Uh, I don't have a really in-depth comment on the question about the UK. It just it it made me think more about the fact that not only are projections notoriously hard to get right on fiscal policy because there's so many other factors in terms of where the economy is otherwise, what would have happened otherwise, and the other mystery of it all is. Uh, so much of what you do in fiscal policy is to avoid certain situations down the road, so to avoid being somewhere else a decade from now or half a decade from now, and one can never know where you would have been otherwise. So um, I, I just think it's a notoriously difficult situation to be in um, in making those projections. And then on that point about act automatic stabilizers, I actually had the same thought when Adam was talking, um, that I sort of think activist automatic stabilizers are in many ways the same as fiscal rules, and that may be where this merges. So, so automatic stabilizers that are linked a little bit more to certain triggers and you know, economic conditions or other things could, in fact, be the next set of fiscal rules. So perhaps that will be another panel that the Peterson Institute will, will host at some point. Okay, um, you can start the next panel for next yeah, time. Yeah, just, just real quick. I mean, obviously, we will be delighted to have Vitor and Maya and Carlo, if you can still afford airfare, um, come back at any time to pursue this, and next time we'll let Jose talk instead of me. Um, just two points quickly. On the rules versus stabilizers distinction, I mean, this gets into uh, meta-philosophical issues, but I just take the rules as the kind of ridiculous things where the U.S. government would say, we're going to have Graham Rudman haulings, or we're going to have, or the Stability and Growth Pact, which failed in the early 2000s immediately after the euro. Oh, we're going to make sure nobody runs a deficit over some number. Those kinds of rules. Right. I think rules that are backed by actual program they're embodied, I should say, in actual programs or institutions, like a form of tax that, ought, that is very highly cyclical, say. Right. That I'm more comfortable with, and if you want to label that a rule, okay, by rule I meant more the person wagging their finger with a clear outcome target. Um, on the UK, uh, with all due respect to the gentleman from the FF set, um, I, I think my colleagues, for obvious reasons, are being a little too courteous. The decision of, of managing director Lagarde to make that intervention in the midst of a European political campaign uh, was above all our pay grade, but was clearly a decision of that ilk and not based on the evidence. And it's a little too cute to say when we have this marvelous book and other studies that actually show the way fiscal policy works in the short term that we can't tell. Uh, my colleague Jay Chopra, who had run the uh, UK Article 4 uh, consultations during the crisis, who is now a visiting fellow at the Institute, has a very good blog on the Institute website about this. I encourage you all to read it. But the bottom line, which I would support, is simply you control for a little bit of what else is going on in the world. And the fact is the UK had the lousiest recovery of any major economy over that period, with the exception of, say, Spain, which was hit by a lot of things the UK wasn't. And it's quite clear that austerity contributed to that. And it's quite clear that even though growth surprised on the upside, it came back after the austerity had eased. And it's quite clear that UK interest rates did not suddenly drop lower as though they had a huge confidence boost every time the austerity was introduced. So it's a little bit, I think, too easy to pretend for the sake of those who want to argue austerity that we don't know. We do. Now, Carlo, I think, rightly got most of the questions because the broader debate 
country by country and in general about how you pace the necessary fiscal consolidation with growth is a serious, serious debate. And that cannot be dismissed. And it's very different for Greece or Portugal than it is for the UK. But that's the point, not that the UK example somehow proves something general about the virtues of austerity. OK, um, thanks very much. And we're coming to an end. I want to thank the authors and for, for presenting this book here, quite interesting, and I think that's being sold outside. Uh, we are also the panelists. We had a very interesting discussion. We have, could have gone for much longer. There are many, many issues in fiscal policy. And finally, thanks to all of you for having been on this great opportunity at the Peterson. Thanks very much. Thank you.